The story of European rabbits in Australia must surely be one of the most amazing examples of an animal's ability to colonize a new land. Just how and why this happened makes a fascinating study. But our story really all begins in Spain. For many hundreds of years, the people who lived in the villages of southern Spain hunted rabbits for food and sold them in the marketplace. The landscape around these villages looks surprisingly like much of Australia. This type of country is thought to be the original home of rabbits. They thrive in dry, sandy soil, which is easy to dig, and the Mediterranean climate of a short, dry summer followed by regular winter rains, means that there is always food for the litters of young rabbits in springtime. Here in Spain, rabbits have many predators. The imperial eagle is one. Wolves are another. So too is the rare European lynx. It seems that the combined effect of all these predators, including man, kept the rabbits in check and they never became a pest in Spain. From earliest times, rabbits were hunted and domesticated in parts of Europe, so it was fairly natural that the Norman invaders should be amongst the first to bring rabbits into England, some time after their conquest in 1066. As time passed, rabbit farming became a useful means of supplying meat and fur to the people of rural England. This house was used by a warrener, who looked after several enclosures that contained specially constructed mounds for warrens. And holes were often dug by hand to encourage the rabbits to breed. Warreners, in fact, used to make a good living by selling off their surplus animals, and so rabbits became very much a part of the English way of life. Many domestic breeds were kept in hutches for food and as pets. And of course, in stories for the young, rabbits endeared themselves to all. When European settlers began arriving in Australia during the 1800s, all kinds of domestic animals came with them. The little colony was to be a copy of their homeland. It wasn't long before rabbits were introduced into the southern part of the continent as a source of food for the settlers. In 1859, the clipper Lightning arrived from England with 24 wild rabbits. These were shipped to Thomas Austin for hunting on his property near Geelong. Here, a few years later, the visiting Duke of Edinburgh shot more than 300 in one day and was delighted. By now, the surrounding countryside had been largely settled and the rabbits began to spread.
But they weren't just spreading by themselves, for a few people soon realized there was big money to be made from selling rabbit meat and fur. And so drovers and trappers carried pairs of rabbits with them, letting them go in areas well ahead of the spreading population. In parts of New South Wales, the impact was becoming serious. Plagues of rabbits stripped the ground of all cover. Very soon, much of the best pastoral country looked like a huge rabbit warren. The economic effect was alarming, and sheep numbers fell to half their previous level. A rabbit drive was the cheapest method of control. Elaborate fences were built along state borders, but always the rabbits got through. By 1887, the situation was desperate. Then in 1898 came news from South America. In Montevideo, Professor Sanarelli of the Hygiene Institute discovered a virus which was killing the domesticated rabbits he was using in his experiments. The virus was traced to the local forest cottontail, which was only mildly affected by it. A few years later, Dr. Arageo, working in Brazil, suggested to the Australian government that this myxoma virus could be used for rabbit control. But the idea of introducing such a disease into Australia created a lot of opposition at the time, and so the proposal was shelved. For the trappers, these were great years. But all the time, graziers were fighting a hopeless battle. At this rabbit drive in 1948, they killed nearly 5,000 in one afternoon. By now, there were strong arguments in favor of releasing myxomatosis. The disease was proved to be harmless to man and other animals, and so, after several attempts to spread the virus among rabbits, myxomatosis finally got away in 1951. Crops and pastures grew in a way that hadn't been seen for years, and the national income rose dramatically. Although myxomatosis had spread over a large area, many rabbits still survived, and their numbers were building up again. Obviously, myxomatosis was not the complete answer. By the early 1950s, it became clear that much more had to be learnt about the rabbit if we were going to get anywhere with our attempts to control it. And so a complete study of the animal was begun. Much of the research work took place at observation sites in different parts of Australia where rabbits could be watched for weeks at a time in their natural state. Left green orange grazing at L43, right red pink. On this site, the rabbits were tagged for easy identification. Males on the right ear, females on the left. A colour code system identified each individual. Rabbits are highly social animals and live in small groups of two or three males and up to six females. They seem to spend a lot of time doing just nothing. Each group occupies an area of land where they can feed, rest and breed. This is their territory, which they mark from scent lands under their chin. 
Animals of the same sex will oppose each other at the borders of their territory, but actual fighting is not common. There are other ways in which all members of the group mark their territory. As we have seen, chinning is one very effective method. Both males and females feel confident on their home ground and will guard their territory throughout the year. All rabbits have scent glands which give their droppings a distinctive smell. This is another way of communication. Sandy soil is preferred above any others for a warren, and a large warren may be the home of several social groups. Part of the rabbit's success as a species depends on being able to live underground, where they can escape many predators and cope with the extremes of temperature which occur above ground. Successful reproduction depends very much on eating green food, and after the winter rains, each pregnant female hollows out a nest chamber at the end of a burrow. During the last week of pregnancy, she brings in tufts of dry grass to form the nest itself. It takes many trips before her nest is complete. Pregnancy lasts about 30 days, and just before birth, the female plucks fur from her body to line the nest. The young are born with the female sitting up. After cleaning her litter, the female will leave the nest chamber, plugging it with soil to protect the young. She'll reopen it once each night to groom and feed them. When the kittens are 10 days old, their eyes are open. They weigh around 120 grams and move about in the burrow. At 21 days, the young will spend much time at the entrance of the burrow. At this age, young rabbits are easily picked off by foxes, cats, or hawks. On this study site, brown hawks were regular predators. All these studies showed that climate has a lot to do with the rabbit's ability to survive and breed. Some parts of Australia are very similar to the Western Mediterranean, where rabbits are thought to have evolved. Here the climate is ideal for them, and each female may have up to seven litters a year. But such breeding rates are only possible if they have a good supply of high-protein green food during the breeding season and dry sandy soil in open country for their warrens. Predators play a big part in keeping the population down, and most of these have been introduced into Australia. Wild domestic cats kill a big percentage of all young rabbits.
Another introduced predator is the fox. A few native birds of prey live on rabbits, catching mainly the unwary young kittens. Although rabbits have adapted easily to Australia's sheep and wheat areas, there are other parts of the country where living is much more difficult. In Australia's alpine areas, rabbits must survive a cold winter with a shortage of green feed. In these areas, the breeding season is very short. It begins when the snow melts in spring and finishes in early summer. This means that only two or three litters are produced by a female each year. In most alpine areas, there is a serious lack of sodium in the soil and plants. On this study site, the rabbits were easily drawn to these experimental salt impregnated pegs. We now know that females with young need eight times more sodium than normal. So this explains why rabbits in these areas don't breed very well. In the dry inland areas of Australia, rabbits face other problems. Here they thrive in sandy soils, and after a period of good rain, there is usually plenty of green feed. But in this sandy soil, foxes can easily dig into the burrows. Here, a nest chamber has been raided during the night. Stony ground may give rabbits a little more protection, but they still need to be alert for many other predators, such as the dingo. In these arid areas, breeding seasons can be very irregular because of the uncertain rainfall. When there are several dry years of little or no rain, many rabbits will die. But when rain does fall, most plants grow very quickly and the rabbits begin to breed again. In one arid area, the warrens were mapped over a number of years and it was possible to see quite dramatic changes in the rabbit population. This area of land had several different soil types. In 1963, rabbits were found mainly in the sand dunes and avoided the heavier soils. In 1965, the start of a dry spell. 1966, very dry, rabbits almost gone. 1969, some good rains, and a fairly big increase in the population. By keeping track of falling rabbit numbers during the dry spell, it was easy to rip up the few burrows where the survivors lived. Ripping at any other time is not likely to be as successful. Myxomatosis still plays an important part in controlling the rabbit population. This rabbit is infected with the Lasan strain. Its killing power is high. Anything which pierces the skin lesions of an infected rabbit can transmit the disease to other rabbits. The virus will stick to the mouth parts of mosquitoes, and so the disease is carried from one animal to another.
During the 1960s, another carrier of myxomatosis was introduced into Australia, the rabbit flea. The biology of this flea is closely tied to that of the rabbit itself, so that once fleas become established in a warren, they can be used to transmit the disease to most of the population. For a long time, Australians have used poisons to keep down rabbit populations. Furrow poisoning, if done well, can be very effective, but we now know that the poison will only kill those animals in territories which the furrow actually goes through. Other rabbits won't leave their territories to reach the bait. But if the poisoning is not done carefully, many of the rabbit's natural predators will also be killed, and if there aren't enough predators left to keep the population in check, the problem could get worse rather than better. Not many animals have ever been studied in such detail, so that we now have a much better understanding of how rabbits feed, breed and survive all over Australia. There's no doubt that rabbits are here to stay. They were brought here by people who didn't realise that this country would be so perfect for them. Because of their great versatility, they've adapted easily to all sorts of different environments and have survived, despite all our efforts to get rid of them. Mm -hmm.